Gracias. Hola. Hola. So I'm from uh, Jess. We are uh, kind of the UK version of Redis, <coughs> and we run uh, Janet Network, the UK NRAND. We run Edge Roam. We run a lot of the same kinds of services that Redis do. We do a few things on top of the network, and we think that there are a few more things that will really um, be game changers. And this is really what I want to talk to you about today. So I'm going to split this into three bits. The first bit, or four bits. What is this Education 4.0? You've seen it in the program. What does this mean? <laughs> what could it change? What could it change about the way that people learn? What could it change about our universities, about our colleges, <coughs> and the way that they operate? In the UK, we've started a, a kind of a dialogue going with our institutions, but also with our government about these changes that we see coming. And we've started to kind of start to build the infrastructure. So we have the infrastructure for education 3.0 already. We have our endings, we have EduRoad, we have uh, Educate, we have a lot of things that we take for granted. But what should the infrastructure for education 4.0 look like? But what is this education 4.0? If you look at what a lot of people in industry are saying right now, they're saying artificial intelligence is going to transform everything that they do. Some <coughs> industries have already been transformed by artificial intelligence, by robotics, by ubiquitous connectivity, being able to get online anywhere. What happens when every seat in the room has a microchip in it and is connected to a central database and we can say, hey, how many people use this room? What happens when we can say, actually, what is, what is the environment like in this room and all the other rooms? Is it too hot? Is it too cold? People choose to sit in one place or another for those sorts of reasons. So we're very interested in, in all of these technological changes um, if you look at the research, there's some research here from the University of Oxford talking about how many jobs will be changed or, or cease to exist through these fourth industrial revolution technologies, things like AI, things like robotics. And it's not looking too good if you're a, if you're a paralegal, if you're a legal clerk, your job will be automated very easily. But I think Gartner and the um, IT consultancy, Gartner have a very interesting perspective on this, which is every industrial revolution we've seen so far has created huge new opportunities. It's created opportunities for people that simply didn't exist before. New jobs, new careers, new <coughs> industries. And this is what we think. We think the robots are coming, but they're here to give us a promotion. <coughs> what does this mean for our institutions, for our universities, for our colleges, and for service providers like Red Iris and, and JIS? Well, we think that there, there are two big things. If you're at a university, uh, like the university where I uh, sat in here today, you've got to change a bunch of the things that you do, if the graduates who come out of your course are still going to be able to find a nice, good job at the end of their studies. So we're going to have to prepare people for near future workplaces, which will be very different <coughs> to what we have now. But also, if you are that institution, a lot of this like I was saying about putting a chip in the seats, about instrumenting the environment in the lecture bit, 
This is an opportunity for you to transform what your institution does. You can use these technologies to make your institution better and to make the experience of being a student here more rewarding, more fulfilling, happier. In the UK, uh, we do a survey every year of students. This year we had 37,000 students respond to the survey, which is all about their uh, digital technologies in their teaching and learning, digital technologies in their institution. And what an awful lot of those students told us, nearly half, was that their course, the way that their university or college uses technology, they feel it hasn't prepared them for the workplace that they will be entering when they leave and they finish their studies. So we've got to, we've got to do some work here. So I'm, I'm coming to you as a UK person saying, we, we recognise, and this is our Minister for Universities, he's basically saying, come on guys, we've got to do some work here. We've got to close this gap. So I'm not presenting the UK as some kind of perfect nirvana where we have figured all this stuff out. We know we've got some work to do. But how will it change? How will these new technologies change things? We've done a, a study, which uh, I put a URL in here for, I'll tweet these links later, <coughs> um, looking at what near future learning environments might look like. Will we still be in rooms like this in 10 years time, for example, or will the robots take over? <coughs> we don't think that the robots will take over, not in that sense. But we think that there are a lot of interesting ways in which we can use technology more to make our institutions more effective, to make our students more successful and happier. Well, how could it go? One possible future is kind of like Netflix. It's the Netflix University. You know, I binge learned over the weekend. I've done a whole load of stuff. I'm kind of bored with this course now. I'm going to switch. I'm going to do something different. And if it becomes possible for people to switch courses very easily, then the bond between a learner and an institution, there's, there's just not very much to it. And we think that that's actually a bad thing for, for institutions, but also for learners. We think there's let's call it the Netflix University, maybe not so good. What we think is really promising is using the technology to make teaching and to make learning more inclusive, to make it more immersive, using technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, and this rather wonderful tractor simulator here. Tractors cost a, an awful lot of money, actually, before you let someone drive a tractor, it's a pretty good idea if they have some idea of what they're doing. So this is one of our colleges <coughs> is teaching people to um, be farmers using this uh, tractor simulator. We think that there'll be a lot more of this. So we're trying to have a, a dialogue in the UK with our universities, with our colleges, with, with the government. And, uh, when I was invited to come and speak to you guys today, I thought it would be interesting to see if we can make that a little bit of an international dialogue. Um, we've come up with some, some big ideas for how the technology might change things. We don't have time today to talk about all of these, but really it's about how the things that we are starting to do now might affect the way that we teach, the way that we learn, the way that our institutions work, maybe five, ten years from now. So for example, uh, can we use artificial intelligence to assess people? It's, it's a very big deal taking uh, examinations. It's very stressful, creates a huge amount of work for people. Can we do, can we do this better? Can we use AI? recognize when people have mastered particular concepts 
in their subject and start to give them points towards their degree in this kind of I will talk about one particular um, example here which is, is very big for me. Um, this is using augmented virtual reality in teaching surgery. So we've got a, a surgeon here who uh, teaches um, classes of trainee doctors and quite, quite recently, not very many years ago, the way he would have done that was that they would have been looking over his shoulder in the hospital while he performed the operation. And you'll see pictures of this doctors looking, how is he doing this? What does he do next? And this guy, Shafi Akbar, he's been uh, streaming his operations via Google Glass, via Snapchat spectacles, you name it, he's, he's tried a lot. Right now he's doing quite a bit of work with Microsoft HoloLens. If you're one of his students, you can see through his eyes the operation that he is performing. You can talk to him while he's doing it. And uh, using virtual reality, you can actually bring in experts from around the world to advise him. So if he's doing an operation, and there is a complication. We just don't know what to do now. I'm going to phone a friend. This is incredibly powerful. So I, I think we'll see a lot more of this kind of thing. In no way is that like this room today. It couldn't be more different. The tractor simulator, in no way is that like this room today. So how could, how could we get from here today, a room like this, to more of that kind of stuff. And that's what I'm doing personally in is, is, is trying to map that course out. But we think it's not about technology. This is not about saying, hey, if we have augmented reality, boom, everything is brilliant, everything changes for the better. This is really about putting students in control of their learning. It's about, perhaps even to the point where every student kind of has their own individual pathway through the course. And that creates lots of challenges for us. How do we assess somebody who's taken a unique pathway through the curriculum? How do we get feedback on a lecturer who's assisted by an AI tutor? Who helped when and where? The concept of feedback changes quite a bit too. So why am I talking about all this stuff? Um, you guys are an audience of network operators, IT people. Well, we, we, we kind of work in that space too. So we built the Janet Network, we built Edgero in the UK, uh, the Shibboleth uh, UK Federation, and all these things. And we think that there is infrastructure to be built for Education 4.0. We've done a little bit of this already, and this is the architecture of our learning analytics service. But what we do here is pull the data from things like virtual learning environments, like Moodle, uh, library systems, uh, student information systems. There's a lot of data these things generate, which is just thrown away. We don't use it. Log files, and some of you here, I've, I've been to some of the very technical talks earlier on today, I know some of you live in a world of, well, I have an AWS volume and my log files have filled this thing up, right, and what am I going to do? I'm going to throw them away. What this is all about is saying, no, there's actual data here. There is useful information here. The fact that somebody came to this room may have been recorded, may have an attendance monitoring system. The fact that I drove here today, I parked my car, at the university, maybe recorded somewhere. If I visited the library, I took a library book out. All of these things, they leave a data trail. And what we're using here is, uh, we're using AI to do predictive <coughs> analytics to say, okay, which of these data trails tell us that this student has a problem? And we need to talk to this student 
because if we don't, maybe they're going to fail, maybe they're just going to stop coming, maybe they have some real problems in their life which are interfering with their studies. So it's not about the machines, it's not about the robots doing something automatic, it's about talking to the, the human being who is that student's personal tutor. We think that there's a lot more that can be done beyond this, and particularly around things like the curriculum. At the moment, um, you will find if you analyse a lot of universities, a lot of colleges, there are peaks in workload. Uh, everyone is very, very busy. Exams, tests, marking, there are these seasonal peaks, which are very time-consuming, they're very busy, they're, they can also be very stressful. And if we want to improve everyone's well-being, smoothing some of these peaks out is a good place to start. Um, if we think about employability, those near-future industries, if I'm training here in the computer science school, I want to be fairly confident that I'm learning the right things that will get me a good <coughs> job at the end of it. So can, again, can we use the data trail to help people make those decisions and get those kind of outcomes? So this is kind of where we're taking it next. I, I talked about um, instrumenting the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure. We call that an intelligent campus. And this is putting sensors into rooms. It maybe is putting sensors into seats. It's knowing what is going on around our campuses, the very fine level of detail. Because today we can crunch millions and millions of data points very easily using cloud resources. It's not a, not a challenge for us. But historically we've either not collected the data points or we've just thrown them away. And we can be smarter. And I've talked about this in the context of teaching and learning. There's a similar conversation to be had about research. We've not really kicked this one off yet, but I have a few talking points here. Principal one, I think, really, is how long will it be before we're routinely using AI to help in research, to do things like text and data mining? And actually, how long will it be before the first AI is awarded a chair, the professor who is an AI? And that is all I have to say today, um, which is gracias. Thank you.